Thank you, Jay. It's nice to be with all of you today. Kind of a rainy day, but clearing. So the, the, the news is good news. Harry Campbell was ill when I first met him. Um, he had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and, and this is what it looks like, according to the National Institutes of Health. It's a disease that affects the airways with inflammation and loss of production of mucus, and it ultimately destroys the lung itself. He was in his mid-60s, kind of an irascible guy. Um, he uh, was, had gray hair, had once been blonde, but his hair was now pretty much gone, except for the, where the barber had cut it pretty close. He always wore wire rim glasses that could have used a little cleaning from time to time. Uh, always suspenders, never a belt. He chose cotton trousers and cotton shorts to come to the clinic, and except in winter when he'd wear a cardigan with leather buttons up the front. He chose, strangely, slippers for his feet when he came to the clinic, and actually later in his illness it turned out that that was a pretty good choice because he wound up with swollen feet and ankles, so that worked out pretty well for Harry. He spoke slowly and softly, um, he would frequently end a sentence with a little bit of a grunt and almost a small cough. And he coughed often and cleared the, the sputum with a, with a handkerchief that he kept in his pocket. He was, could be cynical and sort of dark, but once in a while I'd notice a little smile creep across his face and through his glasses I'd see a humorous glint from time to time belaying his, his seriousness of his illness and his cynicism as well. Now Harry had smoked two packs of unfiltered camel cigarettes for 40 years. And for those of you who are mathematically inclined, that's 1.1 million cigarettes, give or take 10,000 cigarettes. I mean, that's an heroic use of tobacco. <laughs> Harry was so bothered, his chest was so irritated and so bothered that any environment, whether it was dust or smoke, really troubled him greatly. He didn't have to come to me to quit smoking. He quit absolutely on his own because tobacco smoke irritated him so much he felt panicky and smothery. And so it was, it was very frightening for him to be in an environment like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Harry, Harry's wife would frequently accompany him to the clinic. Uh, his wife, Carol, was a very nice woman, very sweet and very quiet. She sat close to him when he spoke. And, um, Harry would, uh, she, she was always dressed for the appropriately, you know, for the season, linens and silks and woolens when it was cold. She sometimes wore a hat, her bag matched her shoes. Um, she would occasionally wear a string of pearls and a gold bangle on her wrist. And she sat close to Harry when he spoke and helped him on and off with his jackets and his, and his uh, sweaters and touched him tenderly on the shoulder as he huffed and puffed simply changing his shirt and his jacket. So as time went by, uh, Harry's disease progressed. Years and months went by, his disease progressed. And we did all the things you do. You know, we added steroids. Uh, we gave him rotating antibiotics. We put him on water pills. We put him on oxygen round the clock. He used oxygen in a little cart when he went to the supermarket, like many of you have seen. Ultimately, he began with a cane, and then from the cane, he went to a walker, and from the walker, he went to a wheelchair like this. It was pretty clear that he was, his, he was failing. His face was swollen from the steroids. His arms showed bruises from simple bumps uh, into a doorway or a table. And he told me that reaching over his head to remove gloves or shoes was simply more than he could do. It made him so breathless. Um, he slept bolt upright in bed at night because that helped him breathe. And even then, he didn't awake in the morning refreshed. And even sadly, he, he approached me about a laxative because even moving his bowels got him exhausted and totally breathless. So Harry was clearly having a very, very rough time with his illness. Um, his, um, his symptoms continued, and he, he had, had coughing and shortness of breath. And, and he was obviously approaching the end of his life. And, you know, I assumed that he understood, and I think he assumed that I understood we were going, but as you'll soon hear, we were both sort of misapprehending what was going on. On the last year of Harry's life, over the Thanksgiving holiday, um, I came into the clinic on the Monday morning, and one of my nurses brought me a clipping from a local newspaper. And the clipping was an obituary notice that Harry had died. And so, you know, of course, that always hits you kind of hard. 
And so what I, what I did was I thought about it for a while and sort of mustered up my courage. And on the Wednesday or Thursday of that next week, I called Carol on the telephone. And I wanted to make sure to extend my condolences and learn a little bit about what had happened. She came to the phone and she was sobbing. And it really took her quite a while to compose herself. And when she did compose herself, this is what she told me. She told me that in the days, in the weeks leading up to the Thanksgiving holiday, that Harry's symptoms really were, were much worse. Swollen ankles and, and sleepless nights. And he told her, he said, Carol, you know, I really don't think I'm going to be able to eat the, the Thanksgiving meal because I, every time I put much in my stomach, it really makes my breathing that much worse. But she said, well, you should try, Harry. So when Thanksgiving Day came, he was actually able to go to the table. He ate a little bit of turkey, a little bit of squash. And when the pumpkin pie came around, somehow you know, he found a little space, a little dollop of whipped cream as well. Now, he did enjoy the family. And he did enjoy the grandchildren you know, even more. So it was sort of a happy day for Harry. And then the family left. And on the Saturday of the weekend after that particular holiday, Carol woke in the morning as usual and sought out Harry, called out to him. When he didn't reply, she went to the kitchen, called out again, and he didn't reply again, so she went to the porch. So although it was unusual for Harry to, to go out into his barn, which was behind the house, she put on her jacket and walked out in the barn and opened the barn door. And there, to her amazement and surprise, she found Harry having taken his own life with one of his prized shotguns. And you can imagine, chaos ensued. The family was devastated and traumatized. And Harry's death marked that family indelibly. And it also changed my life. I can tell you that I was overcome by a sea of recrimination. You know, what had I done wrong? How had I not, how had I missed the depth of this man's suffering? How had I failed him so utterly? So it was. Obviously, for me, a lot of nights without sleep and a lot of days ruminating, thinking, and considering. So I went to my colleagues, and I asked them. I said, tell me, you know, this is my story. Have you ever, anything like this ever happened in your practice? And, not, and to my surprise, it wasn't a unique situation with me. It turns out many of them who had had chronically ill patients suddenly lost them to circumstances that were unclear, but probably those patients, too, had taken their life. So in a way that all academicians do, I jumped in the medical literature and looked. And here's what I learned. I learned in the United Kingdom, they've actually looked at this issue fairly carefully. And they found several things. First, they found that individuals who are male, male individuals, are much more likely to end their life with suicide. And secondly, people who have a terminal diagnosis of, of end-stage cancer, for instance, are at much higher risk of ending their own lives. Another piece of work that was also done in the United Kingdom found that as many as 10% of all suicides in the United Kingdom are associated with someone with chronic disease. That is to say, those people who committed suicide had a serious underlying chronic disease. <clears throat> and so as I thought about it, and I thought about um, the kind of illusion that he had and I had, we were sort of sharing denial together in this particular instance. His I think his illusion was that he might get better, and my illusion was that he might not die. Turns out that we were both wrong. Caring for Harry taught me some very important lessons, and I want to share those lessons with you. The first one is the power and the magic of medical science has finite, unforgiving limits. There are some things we just cannot do. Curing a disease like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is simply beyond our ability. And I think part of the thing that generated some of my denial was the fact that I wound up with an empty black bag of curative tricks I really didn't have any more. So I think physicians, when they get to those limits, need to face those limits themselves. And to the extent they can gently do that, they need to share that with their, their patients and with the patient's family. The second lesson is that wishful thinking creeps into clinical judgment in subtle ways. We know from very important medical studies, additional medical studies, when the bond between the patient and the physician, oh, sorry, <laughs> patient and the physician is, is, uh, is very tight. I'm, trying, I'm going to work my way back here. So when the bond between the physician and the patient is particularly tight, the ability to be accurate in prognosis is weak, is not as good. Wishful thinking makes it such that we over 
our expectations exceed the likely uh, life expectancy of those patients. We, we simply miss it. We blow it. And that's not fair to the patients. It's not fair to ourselves. So the guidance here is that we need to have those end-of-life discussions sooner. We need to have those discussions at a time when there is life left and the patient can think about it carefully, talk it over with family, and then make a decision about what uh, he or she might do. Now, that really, if you think about it, amounts to medical planning, right? It's just medical planning, which reminds me of a story from the American philosopher Yogi Berra, who maybe some of, <laughs> some of you have heard about. And this is actually involved in Yogi and his wife. And you realize that Yogi's now passed away and his wife as well. But before he died, Yogi's wife, excuse me, Carmen, sat down with him. She said, Yogi, you know, you had such a wonderful career. You had so many fans. Tell me, when you die, do you want to be buried in Brooklyn? Would you like to be buried in New Jersey? Or, or how about St. Louis? These are all possibilities. And so he scratched his head and he thought, he said, oh, I don't know, Carm, surprise me. <laughs> so, surprise, that's not a plan, right? It's like hope is not a plan. Surprise is not a plan. We really need to do a better job. One of the things I've learned as a clinician is that jumping into that end-of-life conversation is not something you should do without the consent of the patient. Because some patients are defended, their denial defends them from thinking about things that they never want to think about, right? And we do not want to breach that denial, that defense mechanism, with you know, talking about things that, that are terribly unpleasant for them. But let's say they do want to, want to talk about it, and we hope they do want to talk about it. In that instance, there's a lot of work that they need to do. They need to think about some things, the emotional part of this, asking forgiveness from people they've offended and forgiving people that have offended them, and then all the medical legal stuff. For instance, we know that everybody should have a will. Everybody should have a living will. Everybody should appoint a health care proxy who could speak for them if at the at the time of, you know, near the time of their death, they, something needs, an action needs to be time, done and they don't have capacity, the proxy can speak for them. They need durable power of attorney so that their affairs can be cared for again if they lose capacity. And here in the state of New York, there's a medical order for life-sustaining therapy, a MOLST document, which is signed by you and your doctor if you're a patient, and it instructs other physicians what they may do, should do, and should not do um, if, in fact, you, you know, you're approaching a place where you've lost capacity. So that's that. The third point I learned, the third lesson that I learned from Harry, is that sudden and violent death is sometimes preferable to long-term suffering, humiliation, and loss of autonomy. The uh, singer-songwriter Billy Joel talks about people who are standing on the ledges of their lives. You know, that, that, that can you imagine this image standing on the ledges of, of their lives? And, and that's really where I think Harry was. I mean, that's an awful, terrible choice that Harry made, but I think we can all have some insights into what happens to the mind when you suffer that long. So Harry then was up on that, that ledge, the life's ledge, and I'm not at all sure that we could have talked him down. I am sure, however, that he should have had options, other choices that would have been far more attractive. Which brings me to the, to the fourth point. And that is, there has to be a better way to extend our caring, to listen more deeply to these patients, to sit with them, to be present with them, to make sure that we offer them everything that they might need. There has to be a better off-ramp from this life than guns and gunpowder and humiliation and massive trauma. There's got to be. And what we know is that in some states in the United States, that is possible. The six states in the United States, it, there is an exit ramp that's dignified and peaceful. And that is called medical aid in dying. Medical aid in dying is a therapeutic intervention or a therapeutic process by which a patient who is mentally capable, an adult, with six months or less to live, may approach their doctor for a prescription that would allow them to end their suffering at a time and place of their choosing. 
Now, the, here's the, the map that you got a picture of quickly before. The reason I show this map is these are the states that now embrace the idea of medical aid and dying. Some people also call this death with dignity. You can see Montana, Oregon, Washington, California, Vermont next door, and recently Colorado in the November election, they voted for it as well. Here in the East Coast, both in New Jersey and in New York, we're working hard to try to get this, to advance this. Um, and we know from polling data that the majority of New Yorkers are in favor of medical aid and dying. They, they favor it for themselves and they favor it for their loved ones. And that's regardless of your party affiliation um, or anything else. And so that's, a, that's, I think, an encouraging thing. Uh, what I'd like you all to do is I'd like you to imagine a scenario where a guy like Harry could have been at home with his family gathered around him, taking a medication and ending his life on those terms and not in, in violent terms. And I think, you know, if you think about it, being at home and dying in the loving arms of, of your family is really what most, most of us want. In fact, a survey that was done by the, American, um, the Journal of the American Society on Aging in 2015 showed these four items are really what people want. Number one, they want to be at home with their loved ones. Number two, they want to make sure their pain and discomfort is managed, both the physical pain and existential pain. Both are managed. Their spiritual needs addressed, and also they don't want to be a burden, right? They don't want to linger and be a burden on their family members. And this, this I think, is, uh, is exactly the kind of thing we're thinking about. Now, in the state of Oregon, you may know this, for 19 years, they've had medical aid in dying, death with dignity. They had it in place, and they collected information on it year by year. In the year 2015, 132 Oregonians chose to use medication for aid in dying. 90% of those people died at home, and 92% died in hospice care. So the combination of palliative care, hospice care, and the availability of medical aid in dying all makes a scenario that brings great comfort both to the patients and also to their families. Now, my uh, enthusiasm for medical aid in dying is, is very real because of patients like Harry. And my goal in the state here in the state of New York is to make the medical practice of medical aid in dying accessible and a legitimate option for people who are, again, adults with less than six months to live who have a terminal diagnosis and who can make that judgment on their own. I really and honestly believe, folks, that this is something we owe the Harry Campbells of New York, the Harry Campbells of all across this country. I think we owe it also to future generations. And folks, we owe it to ourselves, right? We really do. So let me close with this quote from Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown in the state of California. Remember, Governor Brown signed medical aid and dying in, in, in 2015, and he was a former Jesuit seminarian. And here's what Governor Brown said. In the end, I was left to consider, in the, uh, in the, sorry, in the end, I was left to reflect what I would want in the face of my own death. I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill. And I would not deny that right to others, nor should we. Thank you very much.